This Jewish History Podcast is sponsored by Barry Dubin in loving memory of Andy Stern, Gershon Yaakov, Ben Moshe, Zechorna Levracha. May his soul have a spiritual ascendancy in heaven. If you would like to support the Jewish History Podcast or any of the other fantastic podcasts from Torch, please visit the donations page on torchweb.org. In fact, there's a new option now on the drop-down menu called Podcast Appreciation. Your support means a great deal to me personally and empowers our organization, Torch, to keep on our mission of connecting Jews and Judaism. Uh, This is the last podcast of the year before Rosh Hashanah. I want to wish everyone and all the listeners and the whole Jewish people a Shana Tava Umetuka, a happy and healthy, sweet new year. May we all be inscribed in the Book of Life, us, our families, our communities, and of course, all of our Jewish brethren here and in Israel. The subject of this podcast and the one that will follow is the history of Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the hidden Torah. Now, before we begin, I want to stress that Kabbalah is a subject that is rife with misconceptions and, in fact, bursting with charlatans. So from the beginning, I want to make it clear that I don't claim to be an expert on the subject, and I made a great effort of trying to research the subject and trying to be as precise as possible and have sources for whatever I'm going to say and quoting only from primary sources. So let's begin with the definition of Kabbalah. Kabbalah is part of the corpus of the oral Torah. So it begins from Moses at Sinai, like all of Torah. And it's transmitted from generation to generation, just like we have the Mishnah and the Talmud and Halacha. It starts with Moses, starts with God at Sinai, and is passed on from generation to generation. But unlike the rest of the Torah, unlike the revealed Torah that is disseminated as widely as possible to the whole nation, the hidden Torah, the Kabbalah, is arcane. It's esoteric. It's known to the very few scholars at the highest level of knowledge and greatness, and it's transmitted from teacher to student in secrecy over the generations. In fact, the word Kabbalah itself means acceptance, as in a student accepting the tradition from the teacher. And there's actually a trivia that the word in English, a cabal, meaning a secret clique or faction or fraternity, derives etymologically from the word Kabbalah. Now, the great Kabbalists of all the generations stress this point, that true Kabbalah is actually not intellectually or rationally deductible. You can't say, you know what, I'm going to use my intellect to try to decipher the hidden secrets of Kabbalah. It must be received from a teacher uh, from tradition. So the, the essence of Kabbalah is something that can only be received by tradition. Now, over the course of the development or perhaps the revealing or unveiling of Kabbalah, this notion remains fixed, that the proper way to study Kabbalah is via a teacher who received it from his teacher, and so on. Even though that's going to change, really, that's going to be the subject of the upcoming podcast, What Happened in the 16th Century, where Kabbalah was kind of opened up to the world to a certain degree. Now, the content of Kabbalah, it's something which is kind of hard to pin an exact parameters to it. You know, what what do we mean when we talk about hidden Torah? What do we mean when we say secrets of Torah? So I want to share a few definitions that I found. So uh, Rabbi Chaim Velazhener, who is a disciple of the Gona Vilna and helped organize the Gona Vilna's writings on Kabbalah, he refers to Kabbalah as Pnimius Nishmas HaTorah HaKtosha. The inner sanctums, the soul of the Holy Torah, meaning that just as man is a hybrid of a spiritual being, a soul, and a physical being, a body, the Torah itself can take shape in various forms. There's the Torah's body, the parts of it that relate to the physical realm, and there is the Torah's soul, the spiritual roots, the underpinnings of the Torah. It's not something which is distinct from Torah, it's just a different realm, a different aspect, a different dimension of Torah. 
Rabbi Chaim Vital, who is the primary disciple and overseer of the legacy of the Arizal, the greatest teacher of Kabbalah, he explains Kabbalah in general in a similar way. A fundamental precept of Kabbalah is the concept that the world that we actually presently occupy is an infinitesimally small world among many different realms of existence and different worlds. In fact, the Kabbalah delineates four types of worlds, Atsilus, Yitzira, Berea, and Asiya, and there is these descending orders of spiritual purity as you move on from one realm to the next realm to the next realm till us. So there's different worlds. Now, Torah permeates all those worlds. And each one of those worlds and the spiritual purity, so to speak, of that of that world has Torah, which is formatted to it. So, for example, there's this idea in Kabbalah called pardes. Pardes is a word that appears all over Kabbalah. And pardes literally means an orchard. But the four Hebrew letters of the word pardes stand for the four realms of Torah. You have the pshat which is the first letter of the Pardes, which is the simple understanding on our level. There's the Remez, which is the hints, the, the, the Drash, which is the more the allegorical, and then there's the Sod, the secret and hidden parts of the Torah. And as we kind of progress from one world to the next, from the more abstract and spiritual to us, the Torah itself is changing. So as an example, if you look at the Talmud, you'll see a discussion, what to do if my ox goes into your property and gores your pregnant cow to death. Now, we don't see that. Uh, We don't see that in action. But we go to your backyard and we find your cow gored to death by my ox. And there's also a dead calf on the side. And the Talmud has a whole discussion. Well, what's the halacha? Do I need to pay you, my ox, after all, killed your ox, your animal. So I need to pay you for the damage that you incurred. But what about the dead calf? We don't know, did my ox gore your cow and therefore result in your cow miscarrying? And therefore, I have to pay you not only for your dead cow, but also the dead calf. Or maybe the dead calf was born, was miscarried before my ox even got to your backyard and... I'm not responsible for that. That's your own loss. That's a question the Talmud debates at great length. In the higher realms of Torah, you're not going to find discussions of oxen goring cows. What that means is we live in a world where there's oxen, where there's cows. It's a physical world. And therefore, the Torah that we have or the, the realm, the dimension of Torah that we have is modified, is formatted for our world. The essence and the holiness of Torah is the same regardless of which world we're talking about. It's just the application is going to be formatted to the respective world. When we talk about Kabbalah, we're talking about the study of the Torah of the higher realms, not the Torah that's relates, that relates to us it's, or to our physical iteration of existence, rather the Torah that exists in the higher realms worlds. And it's important to note that Kabbalah is a, more of a general term. There's theoretical Kabbalah, which is almost like a map of the spiritual world. There's meditative Kabbalah. There's practical, maybe even magical Kabbalah. And the most common kind of Kabbalah that we meet today is what's called Tame HaMitzvos, which is giving a Kabbalistic tinge to the meaning behind the commandments of the Torah. So with these introductions, let's examine some of the history and the development of Kabbalah. I think a good place to begin is is the Talmud. The Talmud is completed and sealed circa the 6th century. And if you read the Talmud, you don't really find many overt references to Kabbalah. However, the later Kabbalists, such as Ramchal and Ramchaim Vital, they stress that it's all there. If you look at the Talmud, the books of the Talmud that we have, all of Kabbalah is embedded and is encrypted in the Talmud itself beneath the surface. Some even suggest that the works of the Talmud were not just, not, not just that the Kabbalah is hidden there, but it's actually all based upon Kabbalah. But if you look and you examine and you probe 
the Talmud, you won't really find it spelled out clearly. Where do you find the Talmud and the Kabbalah? So that's what's called the Agadita or the Agadic teachings, which essentially amounts to all teachings that don't have halachic ramifications. There's all kinds of philosophical statements in the, in the Talmud, stories, parables, ethics. There's even medicine and pharmacology. Says Ramchal, all those teachings are essentially teachings of Kabbalah that are being hidden, that are being encrypted beneath the veneer of the surface subject matter. And he explains that the sages of the Talmud, when they wanted to write down the Talmud, there was a need to do that, after all, because there was a concern that maybe the Torah would be forgotten. After all, they were living under very harsh conditions, very harsh subjugations. It was very difficult to amass the students and teach the oral Torah the way it was done prior. And we've spoken about this in previous episodes and exactly how it worked out. So there was a need to write down, to commit to paper for eternity, to canonize the oral Torah. And part of that, of course, is the hidden parts of the oral Torah. But they were faced with a dilemma. If the hidden Torah, if the, or, if the hidden parts of the Torah are not supposed to be studied by everyone for a variety of reasons, they are only intended for the people at the highest level of study and knowledge, how are we going to commit that to writing? How are we going to put that in a Talmud without letting the secrets be publicized to everyone? And therefore, what they did is they decided to write it down, but cryptically. It would be disrespectful to spell it out, spell out all the content of the Kabbalah in the Talmud. Instead, you hide it. You disguise it. You disguise its contents. In addition, there was a concern that because the subject matter is so astoundingly profound, unless people have a pure mind, and penetrating intellect capable of sifting through all the subtleties, it may actually have backlash. It may lead to a negative result, misunderstanding or perversion. And therefore, what was agreed upon, that they would put it in the Talmud, but encrypt it in a variety of ways, so only the people who have the keys to decode it will be able to understand it. And Ramchal offers several ways that they would do that. So first, they would use parables, analogies, metaphors that if you read them simply, don't seem to have much meaning and you are most likely to misinterpret it and not really understand what the true intention of it is. That's number one. Number two, another method that the Kabbalah was hidden in the Talmud, in the Agatha teachings of the Talmud, is by omission of critical aspects of the teaching by writing only partial information, but omitting other critical information such as the circumstances or the like, that will ensure that the people who are unqualified to study it will not fully understand it. Which, by the way, would explain the propensity of teachings in the Talmud that seem to contradict each other The reason why they contradict each other is not because they're in conflict, but because the whole story is not being told. There's limiting factors. There's information that's being omitted. And therefore, each teaching is confined to its own domain, and they're not in conflict, but all that was not publicized. Another way they would disguise teachings of Kabbalah in the Talmud is by offering grand, lofty ideas in other ideas that seem inconsequential and non-essential. So, for example, this is Ramchal's example. In the Talmud, in Shabbos 152, it says that Rav Dimi came from Israel to Babylonia, and he said the following statement, Youth is a crown of roses, old age is a crown of thorns. That's what he said. And to us, that sounds like it's some sort of uh, teaching from Confucius, it doesn't seem to have, it's like an, it's like an axiom. It doesn't seem to have uh, much subtlety or meaning behind it, but there's some sort of Kabbalistic idea that's being conveyed and written in a way that we won't understand it. And finally, 
Kabbalah was also disguised amidst teaching on natural phenomena based on the precept that everything in this world stems from forces in the spiritual. So they may be talking about medicine or physics in the Talmud, but it's not talking about like the physical medicine or the actual physics of our world, but like the physics of the spiritual world, and it's all being hinted. So, so that's this first idea that we see, that all of Talmud is, is rife with Kabbalah, but we can't understand it because it's, it's encrypted. So that's with respect to the covert Kabbalah in the Talmud. That said, there are hints of hidden Torah that are more overt all over the Talmud. So for example, there's a book called Sefer Yitzira, the book of creation or the book of formation. This book is a very thin volume. It's only a few hundred words. According to Jewish tradition, it's authored either by Abraham or perhaps Rabbi Akiva. Alternatively, it's authored by Abraham, but organized by Rabbi Akiva. And the Talmud mentions this book and its power uh, several times. So, for example, in the book of Sanhedrin, page 65b, we read the following sentence, Rava bara gavra. Rava, one of the sages of the Talmud, Bara created Gavra a man, which is, of course, a very shocking statement. Rava was able to create a man, and he sent him to one of his colleagues. And this man was appearing before the colleague, and the colleague started talking to him, and he realized the person that he was talking to is not a real person because the person is not talking. They weren't given the power of verbalization. And therefore, he said, Ah, I see you're not a real person. You should go back to your dust. So this is the idea of a golem, the idea of using some Kabbalistic secrets from the book of Yitzira, Sefer Yitzira, to take the letters of God's name and arrange them and organize them in a certain way to be able to mimic, to recreate creation and to go through the steps that, so to speak, God used to create the world and therefore to be able to create people, create worlds, create all kinds of things. The next citation from that teach from that page in Talmud says something quite similar. It says Rav Hanina and Rav Oshia, two of the sages of the Talmudic era, every Friday would study Torah and specifically would study the book of Sefer Yitzira. And through their study, amidst their delving into this great Kabbalistic work, Umivluhu Idla Tilsa, and they would create a fat calf. And they would eat it on Shabbos. So when their wives would send them to do shopping before Shabbos, they would go study Torah. And through their study of Torah, they would create the animal that they would eat on Shabbos. Which is obviously a very shocking statement. But clearly there's some sort of Kabbalah wisdom or power that is being discussed here that we seem to have no access to. We have no idea what this this means. How do you do it? A few more examples of overt references to Kabbalah in the Talmud. We read about Bitzalel. Bitzalel is the man commissioned by Moshe through the direction of God to build the tabernacle and all its vestments and vessels. And what was so special about Bitzalel, says the Talmud, he knew how to combine the letters that God used to create heaven and earth. Again, this sounds a lot like Sefer Yitzira, that there's these system of letters that the Almighty used to create the world, and if you know how to rearrange them, you too could kind of do that yourself. Obviously a very very shocking idea. Another example of Kabbalistic power that we don't seem to have much access to, in chapter 2 of Exodus, we meet Moshe, who was a young boy, And as he rises to adulthood, his coming of age episode is when he goes out and he tries to help his Jewish brethren. And the first episode we read about is that he sees an Egyptian man striking a Jewish man of his brethren and he kills them. And if you read a few verses later, it seems that he killed that Egyptian via the power of speech. So what does it mean that Moshe use the power of speech to kill the Egyptian. So Rashi, quoting from the Midrash, says, Moshe killed him by uttering the ineffable name of God. 
Moshe said something, he said one of God's names, and via that, he was able to kill the Egyptian. Obviously, this is something very beyond anything that we know in Torah. Two more examples. In the book of Sukkot, on page 28a, it's giving a, an accounting of the Torah prowess of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He is the great sage at the end of the Second Temple era. And it's describing his grasp of, of Torah. He knew all of Scripture and all of Mishnah and all of Talmud and all of the Halachos, which is the practical application, the Agados, the Agarata that we spoke about. And then it lists things that, that we, we don't seem to have any access to. He, was a, he knew everything about conversations with angels, conversations with demons, conversations with palm trees. Maise Merkava, the account of the chariot, which is a reference to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 1, where it describes the chariot of God, which are obviously things that we don't seem to understand at all. So again, another reference to other aspects of Torah that don't seem to be part of our understanding. And the last example that we're going to bring is the episode recorded in the book of Menachos on page 29b. And it tells that when Moshe ascended to heaven to receive the Torah, he saw the Almighty writing a copy of the Torah scroll. And on it, it had crownlets above certain letters. If you look at a Torah scroll, you'll see that above certain letters, there are these crowns. And Moshe inquired as to why does God need to give us a whole Torah, an amazing Torah, but also to embellish it with these crowns. And the Almighty tells him, well, there's going to be a great sage in about 1,500 years from now, and his name is Akiva ben Yosef, Akiva, son of Joseph, the great Rabbi Akiva. And he is going to study not only the words of the Torah and all the lessons that they contain within them, but also the various embellishments, the crownlets above the letters. He is going to be able to deduce from each jot and tittle above the letters piles and piles of laws. What the Talmud is indicating is that there's a whole world of Torah that Rabbi Kiva had access to that we don't seem to understand at all, something to do with the actual shape of the letters of the Torah and what they can teach us. So clearly there's something there. Beyond the anecdotes of Kabbalah that we find in the Talmud, uh, there are two pages in the book of Chagiga which are dedicated to the parameters and the guidelines of the study and the teaching of Kabbalah. And it's interesting that the bulk of the Talmud's overt writings on Kabbalah are all dedicated to the prohibitions of teaching and studying it. And the Talmud says, Ein dorshim ba'arayus You cannot teach lecture about the intricacies of the prohibited relationships in front of three people. Velo You cannot lecture about the account of creation of what God did to create the world in front of two people, only in front of one person, and not about the account of the chariot, even to one person, unless he's a great sage and is able to understand on his own. Again, the Talmud is telling us that there's parts of the Torah that are not intended to be taught in a public fashion because it can lead to misinterpretations and to perversions. Instead, it is to be transmitted teacher to student on a one-on-one basis. In some parts, the account of the chariot can only be communicated to a great scholar, and even then, it's only with vague hints, with chapter headings, with the hope that the student will understand whatever they are capable to understand on their own. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am not an expert on these subjects, but I will advise anyone who's interested in dipping their toe in this to just read chapter one of Ezekiel, and they'll see quite clearly how much this is, how esoteric the subject matter is, how arcane it is, and how hard it is for us to even fathom what is going on about that. And certainly if you read the beginning of Genesis, chapter one of Genesis, it 
really the whole account of, of, of Genesis of creation, it does not seem to be intuitively understood. There's obviously a lot there beneath the surface that is beyond us. But I want to quote um, one teaching from the Talmud when it talks about the Maise Bratius, the account of creation, because it references an idea that really permeates all aspects of Kabbalah. And that is the Talmud says that the Almighty created the world with 10 things. And he gives a list of these 10 characteristics, so to speak, that the Almighty used to create the world. And all the commentaries explain that these 10 things are the same as what's called the 10 spherot, the 10 emanations or 10 lights. And this originally appears in the Sefer Yetzirah, but these are emanations through which God, according to the consensus of all the Kabbalists, interacts and interfaces with his world. And there's an idea in, in Kabbalah that every time we see uh, the number 10, it references or corresponds to these 10 emanations, these 10 spherot. So for example, the Mishnah points out that if you count the amount of times that God speaks in the Genesis account, it's 10. There's 10 utterances. Uh, of course, there's the 10 commandments, and then there's the 10 tests of Abraham, and then there's the 10 plagues of Egypt. And this idea of 10 is this idea of bringing to fruition or to create something complete. And every time we have a creation of something which is complete, it equates to these 10 spherot, these 10 emanations, this, this format, this protocol that the Almighty placed in the world. Uh, the Talmud also lists the seven heavens and the various distances between each of those heavens. Obviously, all those teachings are way beyond our comprehension. What does it mean, the seven heavens? And what does it mean that there's distance between them? What's above them? What's beneath them? What's between them? Obviously, those are things which are very heavy Kabbalah and very hard for us to grasp. And the Talmud also tells us about how Kabbalah was transmitted in antiquity. So, for example, the Talmud there in Hadidah, page 13a, tells us that Rabbi Yochanan sent to Rabbi Lazar, I will teach you about the matters of the Merkava, the matters of the chariot. And he responds, no, I am not old enough. But when he was too old, Rabbi Yochanan had already passed away. So there's this idea here that even the great sages like Rabbi Elazar, even though their teacher offered to teach them, they hesitated to do that. And by the time he was old enough and he felt that he was worthy, his teacher had already passed. And the Talmud also gives a whole list of other episodes of, of teachers teaching students or refraining from teaching from students. Again, what we see here in the Talmud is that there's an entire body of knowledge that for us is so arcane, it's so hidden, it was, and even in antiquity, it was only transmitted orally from teacher to student, and even then, they only gave over small fleeting glimpses of the ideas to be understood on their own. And I think the reason why it's so beyond us is that this is really information that people would dwell upon when they wanted to achieve prophecy. And Rama himself spells this out, that the way for someone to achieve prophecy is first by making themselves a vessel, an individual who is capable of absorbing godly messages, and then that person immersing themselves in the Pardes, in the Kabbalah, in the hidden Torah, and that would be the means through which they would be able to receive prophecy. This would, of course, explain why, for people like us, these ideas and their full-blown manifestations are totally beyond us. And the Rambam and the Talmud, they also compare this idea of Kabbalah to honey or to dessert. Just like if you have, um, you have a meal, no one eats dessert for the whole meal. You first fill your belly with meat and potatoes, and only then do you have a little bit of honey to top it off eat too much of the honey, if that's all you eat, you'll vomit. And even when you do have the honey, you keep it under your tongue and you don't share it with everyone. And there is a sad episode uh, in the Talmud 
uh, about great sages who tried to use the study of this level of Kabbalah to achieve a level of prophecy, and it didn't really work out for them. This is the famous episode of the four sages that entered the Pardis, that entered the orchard. And they were trying to use their study and their immersion in the Maise Merkava, in the account of the chariot, to strive to achieve a higher level of prophecy or close to a level of prophecy. And these great sages are Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, and Rabbi Akiva. These are the who's who of the great sages of the first and early second century. And three of them, they got too close and they ventured beyond their capacities in studying this esoterica, and all of them died each in their own way. So Ben Azai, he actually died, and Ben Zoma went mad, and Acher, the third individual, he went awry, he became a heretic, and only Rabbi Akiva entered peaceably and exited peaceably as well. And this indeed shows the danger of the subject it's essentially playing with fire. Even if you take the necessary precautions, injuries is plausible and maybe even likely. Uh, these were giants. These were tremendous sages, but they themselves went too far and got singed. Now, one of Rabbi Kiva's primary students is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, during a particularly oppressive time in the Roman rule over Israel, it's known as the Hadrianic Persecutions, Rabbi Shimon made a disparaging remark about the tyrannical regime, and he had to flee for his life. Now, the Talmud tells a story in the book of Shabbos 33b. Him and his son went to hide in a cave, and a miracle occurred, and a carob tree sprouted up at the entrance of the cave, as well as a spring of water. They took off their clothing, would sit covered with sand up to their necks, and they would study Torah the whole day like that and they would only get dressed for prayer. They're in the cave for what turns out to be 13 years, and during that long and isolated stay in the cave, according to Jewish tradition, him and his son, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and his son, were able to delve into the hidden mystical levels of Torah and write the Zohar, which becomes the essential book of Kabbalah, even though it was not published until a millennium later. And again, we see the same idea that because there was a concentrated effort to write on all of oral Torah, just like you have the writing of the Sefer Yetzirah, and you have the writing of the Zohar, and you also have uh, writings of the Sefer Habarir and the Pirkei Hechalos Rabasi, all kinds of Kabbalistic books are being written. These books are extant, or maybe manuscripts of them are extant, but they're still totally baffling to the uninitiated reader. The wisdom of Kabbalah, the keys to unlocking and decoding the meaning of these books are transmitted orally from sage to sage in successive generations. That's the way it would remain for centuries. In the medieval era, there's going to be a surge in Kabbalah, both in the form of new works, such as the Ramban's Commentary to the Torah, and in the late 13th century publication of the Zohar, that work, again, that was attributed to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, today you can buy copies of the Ramban of Nachmanides. Nachmanides was born in 1194, passed away in 1269. You can buy copies of his commentary on the Torah that are translated into English, but there are certain parts of his commentary that are so Kabbalistic that they aren't even translated by, for example, Art Scroll that has a translation. And just to get a flavor of his commentary and his approach, I want to read to you some excerpts from the fascinating introduction that the Ramban gives to the Torah. And he begins his introduction with a question. Moshe, of course, gave us the Torah, wrote us, wrote us the written Torah. Uh, either at Sinai he wrote most of it and then wrote it successively over the course of the rest of the 40 years before his passing, uh, or it was written all the way at the end. Regardless, at the end of Moshe's life, he delivers to us the five books of Moses, 
the Torah. But his question is, it should have said, there should have been a verse, the very first verse in the book of Genesis should have said, and God spoke to Moshe all these words saying. Why is Moshe not attributed at the beginning of the book that he's writing from God? Why does it talk about Moshe in third person? Why is Moshe not speaking throughout the Torah in first person? After all, he was one who wrote it down, who transcribed it. Why does he not refer to himself in first person? And why does it not begin with the verse that says, these are the words that God told Moshe? And the Ramban answers that Moshe's transcription of the Torah is dissimilar, is different than the rest of the writings of the prophets. So Ezekiel says, God spoke to me, speaking in first person. Jeremiah says, and the word of God was to me saying, it's all first person. Moshe wrote everything, both the things that happened before him, his descriptions of himself, everything that happened to him, all as third person. Why? Because the Torah preceded the world, and certainly the birth of Moshe. In fact, and he quotes the tradition, that the Torah predated the world and was written with black fire on top of white fire, and therefore there was like an existing copy of Torah before the world, and what Moshe was like a scribe who was copying from an ancient work. And therefore, he is talking about himself and everything that happens, even though he's a character in the story, but he's really copying from an existing work that predated it all. This idea is just a, a fascinating idea, that there's a version of Torah that's this book written with black fire on top of white fire that predates the world and that Moshe, so to speak, used to copy when he wrote his version of the Torah. And he explains, the Rabbani explains, and you read this and it's obvious that there's deep Kabbalah that he's conveying here. He says that the Torah exists on different realms. There's one realm, the one that we have, which if you read it, it sounds like a narrative. There's some story, there's some episodes, there's lessons, there's 613 mitzvos. It's, 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 it's written in, in, in a narrative format with, with mitzvos, the instructions. That's one way. There's a second dimension, a second iteration of Torah where it's also the same letters but the letters are broken out differently. They're, they're scrambled in a different way, which means that the breaks between the letters are different, and the whole Torah is spelling out names of God. And therefore, Moshe was given these letters, and he unscrambled them to create the narrative, but he also got the other version of Torah where the letters were organized. It's the same order of the letters, but the breaks between the letters were different. And that spelled the names of God. And he gives an example. The first few words of the Torah are Bereshis, Bara, Elohim. In the beginning, God created. Those same letters can be scrambled to read Berosh, Yisbara, El Hayam. It's the same exact letters, but because the breaks are different, it's different words. Similarly, says the Ramban, all of Torah, from the first word of the Torah to the final word of Torah, all of that, the way we have it, that's one way that Moshe was given it, but he was also given orally the other way of reading it, the other way of decoding the letters of the Torah in a way that it spelled out the names of God. And that's part of the Ramban's introduction to his commentary. And that's, of course, the Kabbalistic nature of his commentaries is felt throughout the book. And he ends with a stern warning to the reader to not try to understand Kabbalah without a teacher, like we said from the Talmud, that the only real way to understand Kabbalah is via a teacher. And he writes, I'm I'm telling you, if you're going to look in this book, Don't try to find your own rationalizations or your own thoughts in a matter of all the hidden things that I'm going to write. Besisre Torah with respect to the hidden parts of Torah. I am informing you very clearly. You won't understand my words. You won't know them. No matter how much intellect and understanding and insight you apply, unless you are mekabal, Kabbalah, unless you accept it from a teacher 
who accepted it from his, his teacher. Otherwise, it's an exercise in futility. Moreover, says the Ramban, it's going to cause damage. And he ends with an instruction, quoting from the Midrash, something that is greater than you, don't try to derive. Something which is stronger than you, don't try to probe. Something that is beyond you, don't try to know. Something that's covered from you, don't ask. Only with what you are allowed to understand, you should dwell upon. You should have no involvement in hidden matters. So even though he's writing down his commentary, which is replete with Kabbalah, he tells us, unless you know what I'm talking about, you unless you have a teacher who's going to teach you about what I'm, I'm, I'm referring to, you're not going to understand it. So he's continuing with the tradition from the times of the Talmud to not spell things out in a way that people who are not prepared don't have all the prerequisites to understand it, they won't understand it. Now, Two decades after the Ramban passes away, a book called The Book of the Zohar is published in Spain by Rabbi Moshe de Leon, and he attributes it to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived more than a thousand years prior. This is the fundamental book of Kabbalah, the book of the Zohar. It is a wide-ranging, voluminous, Kabbalistic commentary on the Torah in Aramaic, It's very complicated, it's very arcane, and it's not easy to make sense of it. And obviously, uh, given that there is a millennium gap between the alleged writing of the Kabbalah and its discovery and publication, some academic skeptics claim that it was Rabbi Dilian, Rabbi Moshe Dilian, who published it. He was the one who actually wrote it, and he ascribed it to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to sell more copies. Uh, And indeed, we don't really have clear explanations regarding how Rabbi Moshe de Leon got access to the Zohar. Uh, There is one legendary account brought by the Chidan, the Shem Agdolim. He says that since the times of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it was all hidden, and then there was a king, one of the eastern kings, who was digging, was excavating some location, and they find this chest. And in the chest, there's this book. And he sends the book to all the Christian scholars. Nobody understands it. It doesn't make sense to anyone. And finally, they send it to the Jews. And even the Jews don't understand it. And finally, the king is desperate. Is there anyone who knows it? And he says, yeah, well, there's one old Jew. And they send it to him. And and the king was so happy that finally someone was able to decipher it, and through that it became published. Those manuscripts, those documents became published. That's uh, one account of how the Zohar was discovered. But already at the time, there were questions regarding the Zohar's authenticity. So Rabbi Yitzchak de Minato, he was a friend of the Ramban and of Rabbi Moshe de Leon. He traveled from Israel to Spain to investigate the matter, and it seems that he concluded that it was legit. Later on, there were studies into the content of the Zohar where they pointed out that there was anachronisms, such as hints to Spanish words. Uh, it mentioned sages that came after Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai chronologically, Uh, There are some discrepancies in the chronology with the Talmud. Uh, There's other questions as to why it's not mentioned in the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Gaonim, and the Rishonim. And in fact, there's been books written on both sides of this argument. But it seems like most of the traditional Jewish sources believe unequivocally that it was indeed written by Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai in the second century of the Common Era. It may not have been finalized by him. There were additions that were put in post Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the same manner that the Talmud was refined and edited after it was, so to, so to speak, uh, sealed. But today, uh, traditional Jews the world over almost universally accept the idea that the Zohar is indeed the hidden Torah, the Kabbalah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And with respect to the lack of the paper trail, uh, there's no explanation of how exactly the Zohar was transmitted from generation to generation. The Arizal, who is going to be 
the subject of the next podcast, he explained that there's really only two ways to study Kabbalah. Either that you receive the tradition from your predecessor, from your teacher, who got it from his predecessor for all the way back to Moshe, or you receive some direct divine communication. An angel came to study with you, Elijah came to study with you, and that's the only, the only way that you can actually access the true Kabbalah. It cannot be intellectually derived at all. And therefore, the Arizal explained that all the people who studied Kabbalah in antiquity, they did it with Elijah, just like the Talmud tells about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that Elijah appeared to him. Elijah also taught him and taught future students and future generations the Kabbalah. And that would explain how it's able to be passed on from generation to generation without us seeing many books or many hints about it. There is a halacha, there's laws about this, there are precedents about it, you cannot publicize it, and therefore you keep it with yourself and you don't let anyone else know about it. That, that would explain how there are few, if any, references in, in writing about Kabbalah for hundreds and hundreds of years. Regardless, the Zohar takes the Jewish world by storm. It begins to appear all over Jewish literature after its publication. But it's hard to understand. It's opaque. It doesn't seem to have a lot of structure or system to it. And in the 16th century, all of Kabbalah is going to change and by extension, the whole history of the Jewish people. In the city of Safed, of, of Tzfat, in northern Israel, there's going to be two towering figures that are going to arise who are going to change everything. These sages, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, known as the Ramak, 1522 to 1570, and Rabbi Isaac Luria, known as the Ari, the Lion, which is an acronym for Eloki, Rabbi Yitzchak, more commonly called the Arizal, they revealed, explained, organized, systematized much of the inner sanctums of Kabbalah. The Ramak wrote a monumental manual of Kabbalah called the Pardes Rimonim, the Orchard of Pomegranates, which systematized and organized the concept of the Zohar by topic. The Arizal himself wrote very sparingly, but his students collected his teachings and committed them to paper. And this is going to yield an explosion of Kabbalah. It's going to come out from the woodwork. And it's going to have wide-ranging consequences that are going to change the face of the Jewish world in all kinds of ways. And we're going to discuss that, please God, in the next podcast. So thank you for listening. As always, you can email me, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Please remember to visit TorchWeb.org to check out all the other great Torch programs and to consider helping support our efforts. Shana Tova, and thank you for listening.